Hello everybody, I'm Colin D. Ellis and welcome to the Culture and Coffee podcast, where every episode I discuss a new topic of workplace culture and provide some insights and some practical things for you to do. Don't forget to like, subscribe and to share with people who you may think would be interested. Okay, let's get on with today's episode. Hello everybody, it's Colin here. Welcome to another episode of the Culture and Coffee podcast. Uh, today I am drinking a Carmelita coffee uh, from Bolivia, from uh, roasted by Market Lane Coffee uh, back in Melbourne. Uh, and very nice it is too. It says here, guava and peach with a tropical fruit acidity. I had a cup before, it's absolutely delicious. Uh, it really is. Uh, and today, to accompany the coffee, I am talking about leaders and how they need to role model the culture that they expect. It's, uh, it's a question I often get, uh, particularly from leaders themselves. And I had a meeting with a new client in, in the UK last week. And we talked about the concept more generally of leadership. You know, for those of you who listen to the podcast for a while, you'll know that leadership is really hard. Very, very few people, leadership is hard. It's a choice. It's very, it's, it's very difficult to put yourself into service uh, to someone. And uh, the person that I met last week, she said, oh, would, would you consider yourself a leader when you were uh, in a permanent employment? And I said, you know, it, it it's, it's one of those things that you can't really call yourself a leader. It's up to other people to decide if you're a leader. Can anyone be a leader 100% of the time? No, it's really, really hard to do that. It's ex- in fact, it's exhausting. And one of the biggest challenges that leaders have is often protecting the culture that you've built from some of the nonsense that happens around you. A great organization cultures are made up of great subcultures and each subculture requires a, a really good manager who knows how to build and define culture. Again, for those of you who've been listening for a while, I talk a lot about this as we, we spend too much time. I think I wrote about this on my blog recently. We spend too much time trying to create, you know, a special small group of leaders uh, when we should actually devote more of our time, effort and money to actually making managers really good managers. And a big part of that is, is how do they build great cultures? Uh, and, and I think this is one of the hallmarks of leaders is they're really good at shaping their own team culture. You know, my last job in the, in the permanent job in the UK, I was a senior manager within, within uh, technology. And we, uh, the organization that I work for as a, a company called, uh, at the time it was Littlewood Shop Direct Group. We had this vision that we wanted to become the largest online retailer in the, new, the UK. And it was a vision that we all bought into. I mean, you know, talk about this today, for, for a vision to be achievable, it's got to be believable. And we all believed that we could do this, even though we were nowhere near that at the time. And that was the vision that really drove us on. It, you know, we use the vision to make decisions. Again, this is how leaders shape culture is, is that they have a really believable vision statement. And then we all went back and we all created our, created our own cultures to contribute to the vision. And, you know, what we did is we kept the values at heart, and, but we were given permission. And that was the first time, that was 2005. That was the first time where I'd really felt that I'd had the permission to do that. Previously, I'd just gone and done it. As you know, when I was a project manager, I felt it was my job to create a good team culture. We didn't call it culture then, but a good team that knew how to work together. You know, this concept of work hard, play hard. It's kind of dated now, but but we worked hard and then we enjoyed each other's company outside of work. That's not to say we spent every waking uh, minute with each other. Uh, I still think a lot of those things are forced when they don't really don't really need to be. Um, so, uh, you know, when it when, when it comes to shaping culture, it has to be very deliberate. And and what leaders do is they role model what's expected of everybody else. They, you know, they, they keep uppermost in their mind, well, what agreements have we made? And that's important. Come back to that in a second. And then what's my role in upholding those agreements such that we 
gain consistency. So what are the, the what are the challenges that we face right now? We, well, the challenges that we face is, is often people in senior positions, we call, often we call them leaders because uh, they're on a senior leadership team, right? But often leaders perpetuate the, the culture that they're looking for in a negative way through their behaviours. The, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation was in the news last week, one of many in the news, um, for having a, a culture of bullying and harassment. Well, that was done on the, on the leadership team's watch. So they're all culpable in that. You know, and I, I don't, you know, this is not about blame. It's about them understanding that actually it, it's what they role model that generated this. And actually two senior people were, were fired because of their behavior. And of course, that's the right thing to do. And they're saying all of the right things and, and, and really what will happen next at the ABC will be driven by what the leaders do differently. You know, that's, you know, how we really shape culture. Because obviously what's gone before hasn't worked. So what are they going to do differently? It's not policy and it's not process. It's about a different level of management skill set to take you to a place that, that you need to go that's different um, than where you are before. And so that toxicity that you see in culture is often created by leaders. I know there are people on this, uh, listen to this podcast, who can say, yes, I worked in a toxic culture and... My leader was responsible for it. The only I've only worked in one. I only worked uh, as a as an employee in one toxic culture, and the leader was a hundred percent responsible for it because he was bullied by his boss, and then he tried to bully everybody else, and it created this horrible position. And what happened within the leadership team? It was really interesting. We called ourselves a leadership team. What was really interesting is there was there was. Five of us, there's six of us, and two of us pushed back, and we said, "Well, we're not going to display those behaviours to to our team." But the other four did, and so what you had is this, you know, kind of permeating toxicity all the way through the the the, the team. But it, it was really driven by one person, and I kind of felt for him in a way because he was put in this enviable, unenviable position where he was really on the receiving end of some bad behaviour. But again, that's leaders; they have a choice. Well, do I, do I copy what I see above me or, or, or am I the umbrella and I make sure that we don't pass that down? And I, I, you know, I often think that leaders want the results, but they don't role model the behavior or the activity required to get those results. Now, uh, what the research says is that, that every organization will get the results that it's looking for, providing that it invests in culture and then as a program of evolution. It's not, this is, I don't use this podcast to sell. This is not a sales pitch. This is fact, right? And and for anybody, if you've read any of my books, read Culture Fix, I've got Detox Your Culture, which is coming out in, at the end of August in, in the UK first. I put all of the research in there. It's it's a fact. And, you know, someone said what motivates you is that I really, I really want people to understand that when they put their time, thought, effort, and money, into developing the fabric of the way that they work, they will get the results, but you have to kind of stick with it. It doesn't happen overnight. I still think there's this requirement for immediate gratification when you invest in culture. And I remember when I first started working for myself, uh, so this would have been 2015, I read a paper about projects. And, you know, projects was, had been my life, even though teamwork and culture of team culture was the thing that I was really invested in it was in the it was in the project world but there was a there was a report by a guy called Peter Shergold and he was a senior leader or he, he had been a senior leader in the Australian government I think and he talked he was talking about the Australian public service and he was talking about all of the problems that they faced with delivering projects were cultural and this was the first thing that I read where I was just like, right, well, I can, pen, I, can, I can actually use this as a mechanism to start bringing to light some of these challenges. And also, you know, what the, what the solution is. And he said, legislation doesn't change culture. People and their actions do. And so at that point, I really started to use that as a foundation for my own practice, for my own knowledge, for my own learning, to try and surface research, to try and surface, uh, you know, kind of papers that, that demonstrated so that I could present it to, to, to the world. Well, you know, he, here's a fact that actually if, if 
leaders role model what they expect of other people if they actually put effort into building culture in the right way um then they'll get they'll get the returns you know i, I shared on linkedin recently i've been working with a, a, an organization for nine months their engagement score went from 58 percent to 85 percent in nine months and that was because of the investment in culture and i you know speaking to the senior leader i was working with I said, have you enjoyed it? He was like, well, no, because it, it kind of went against everything that I'd been taught when I was coming up through the ranks is that if you shout and scream at people, you'll get the results. He's like, but it didn't work. I was like, well, no, it doesn't work now. It might have worked in the 80s and 90s, but it definitely doesn't work now. And he said, you know, I really had to change the way that I think. He's like, so now I look back and I'm like, wow, this has been such a great journey. But did I enjoy it at the start? No, because I didn't get the immediate results that I was looking for after month three, but here we are in month nine, not only do we have a, an increase in engagement, but increase in productivity, increase in sales. Um, he said, and for the first time ever, we've had no negative comments on our uh, survey, or our engagement survey. All we've got is positive comments from people who want to make a difference. And so, you know, I share some of these case studies on my website for people so that they can actually go and look and be inspired by other people. Um, but, it, but it always comes back to the leadership of the team. And often I'll work with individuals who are really trying to make a difference. Sometimes it isn't the entire organization itself. Sometimes it's individual leaders within that organization who recognize that it's incumbent on them, they're accountable um, for, for, for the culture that they create and, and they want to be the people that push against. You know, working with, with one leader and um, she said, you wouldn't believe how much pushback I've had on doing just a two day, we're just taking the team out for two days. She said, won't believe how much pushback I've had. I said, well, kudos to you for sticking with it and sticking by it because other leaders would just cave. I still think there are many in HR who are put under pressure by, by other leaders within the business and they cave and they go, okay, we won't do it. When they know it's the right thing to do, they know it's the right thing to do. But I read a paper when I was when I was researching uh, detox your culture. So I read a paper and it said that executive behavior is the number one indicator of culture risk. Right. And, and uh, it, it really is. Every time you see a culture story in the paper, it's either a, a member of the leadership team who's the problem or else something's happened on their watch that they've turned a blind eye to. And it really is that, you know, you're only as good as the behavior that you choose to walk past you know leaders really do cast long shadows it's the the behaviors are amplified you know often tenfold and ripple out across the business and it doesn't matter whether it's a an eye roll in a meeting checking their phone in a meeting it doesn't matter whether they treat one person badly on a sports field but the rest of the team can see it or better is the positive that they do, you know, and I and I think that, you know, the greatest gains that leaders get is, is when they display positive behaviors. So empathy is the number one requirement of, of, of all leaders. Uh, so whenever you see a, a Gen Z or a millennial survey that talks about what they require from the people above them, number one is empathy, that ability to feel into somebody else. It's not drive for success it's not push them all the way it, it's actually they want to be understood so empathy compassion listening humility vulnerability these were all seen as a sign of weakness in the past now they're a real sign of strength innovation so doing things differently making good decisions um and and, and actually having no tolerance for poor behavior and poor performance there are still far too many individuals, still, sorry, there are still far too many teams that allow one or two individuals to ruin it for everybody else, to ruin the culture for everybody else. And it's leadership's responsibility to actually deal with these people. And for some reason, they're afraid uh, of doing it. And this is why we get statistics. You know, McKinsey's did a paper last year and only 25% of the people surveyed actually considered their leadership team to be inspiring and fit for purpose. So one in four. Um, and even if you're a senior leader now, that's a question you should be asking. 
your staff do you see us as inspiring and 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 fit for purpose in 2024 and beyond if the answer is no then you've got a lot of work to do because remember it's only through the culture that you create and role model that results are actually delivered um and so you really do need to 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 think hard about how you behave how you act and then how you generate trust i think that you know if 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 you want kind of mistrust in your organization have one set of rules for leaders and then have a completely different set of rules for everybody else. Now, you know, often people will think, oh, well, you know, we're a leadership team. We should fly business class and employees. I'm not necessarily talking about that per se. I'm talking about the behaviors you demonstrate. You know, I said to, I said to a leader on a plane in business class once um, and, and we were talking about arriving at a destination feeling fresh, feeling ready, you know, because that certainly for me, that's something I have to do. I have to land and immediately I have to run a workshop. So, you know, you have to be as fresh as you possibly can. But I talked about the fact that actually, you know, kind of what we expect from leaders is, is, is a different level. And people will forgive a simple thing like a parking space or, or, you know, fly in a different class. They'll forgive that if you're a lovely human being. It won't even, it won't even become a, a thing if you're just a great human being who knows how to treat people and who knows how to create the environment for success. I was speaking to, two weeks ago, I was speaking to a, a, a potential new client and the guy was a, an engineer and, uh, you know, kind of traditionally not really spent money on culture, but understands the importance of it, right? And talking about kind of the soft, warm and fluffy approach, which is very much a very detail-oriented way of thinking about culture. And I said, you know, that's half of what culture is. I was like, but actually the other half is discipline, drive, creativity, investment in money in the right things it's you being bold enough to say we're gonna do something different you know you you'll 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 never lose when you invest in your culture provided you put it in you know spend it in the right way and and really helping him to understand that there are these two facets to culture there's being a great human being but then there's there's discipline drive vision values is making sure that you're doing things for the right reason making sure there's a good strategy that's something that I've written about talked about recently you know and this is what we expect of leaders. and you know what to his credit took it all on board and and you know really started to see well actually the stuff that I can learn here now I always say if you think you're the smartest person in the room if you think you've got all the answers you're probably in the wrong room we can always significantly improve the knowledge that we have. Carol Dweck talked about this in her book, Mindset. She talked about, you know, the fact that if you invest in your own education, if you recognize that you're not the finished article, if you recognize there's more you could do with your team, then you will always win in, you know, in whatever winning means for you. Um, you'll, never, you, you'll never be faced with this kind of toxic environment because you're constantly thinking about, well, what do we need to do next? And what you need to do is kind of devolve the definition of culture to others. What you then need to do is role model the behaviors that the group agrees. You've got to role model it and say, this is how we, this is how we do it. You remove the people that you allow, you've allowed to, to undermine culture. And as a leader, you hold yourself to the highest standard um, kind of every time. I had, I had a, a leader who listened to this podcast last year. And he said, he might still be listening to it. You know who you are, because I'm talking about you. Who said um, that it was only when he listened to this podcast, he realized that he didn't have all of the answers. And actually, he brought me in to work with his team. And it completely changed the dynamic of the team. There were one or two issues at the time. And it completely changed the dynamic of the team. And he said, he was like, it was only through listening to this, I realized that there's just so much I don't know about the way that we work in 2024 and you know I, you know, I always say that's my my job is to be clued up on what works now so I can help it to help you to make it your job and this is what great leaders do right and 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 I think that when leaders act, well I don't think that what the research says is when leaders actively educate themselves 
and then and then demonstrate that that almost that knowledge that that humility listen i haven't got all the answers but i want you to know i'm educating myself you know they get like i think it's like 150 percent increase in in great work below them um you know the, the attrition rate goes down and what they get is this increased respect from employees to sort of say well okay and when you think about it it's it makes sense if you it, if you if your manager is a role model for you then increase loyalty. You're going to be more honest with them because you feel like you can. There's no sense of fear. You're going to be more engaged in your work because because they are too. So why wouldn't you be? There's greater understanding. The there's more openness. You challenge them more again because you feel like you can, and you work harder. I've had a you know I've, I've been on record before in my time. I've worked for six people who I would consider to be leaders leaders in terms of their behavior, the investment they put in the team. I would work, a couple of them have retired now, and I would work for any one of them, again, in a heartbeat, because they were the ones that that kind of gave the staff the opportunity to shape the culture, and they were the ones that role modeled it to everybody else. And in those scenarios, those leaders and those teams will always, always be successful. And if you're an employee on that team, as I was, you will then spend your career trying to repeat what they did so that you get the the, the same results. So yes, I hope you said that, oh, enjoyed today's podcast. It's really about how leaders shape culture. And it doesn't matter whether you're, if you're not a leader at the minute, I want you, I want you to aspire to something different. I want you to hold yourself to a high standard. I want you to educate yourself on why investing in culture is the right thing to do. And then I want you to see yourself as a role model and ask yourself, if you were an employee working for you, is this something that, that you know, kind of you would appreciate? Is this something that would motivate you? Is this something that would inspire you to do great work? Hope you've enjoyed today's Culture and Coffee podcast. Try for now. Thanks for listening to today's podcast. If you'd like to find out more about how I can help you transform the culture of your team, head to my website at www.colindellis.com.